It might be ragweed, cats, dogs, peanuts, or insect bites. One in five of us suffers from some level of allergic reactions. Allergies, they're nothing to sneeze at. The doctors are on call tonight. Funding for On Call is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call, starting its 11th year of opening doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. Hello and welcome to On Call Television. Tonight the topic has to do with allergy and hypersensitivity reactions. In 1963, experts defined four types of conditions that happen as a result of an overexcited immune system. The first group, called type 1 allergic reactions, which happen very quickly, result from the production of a special IgE antibody and the release of histamine from special mast cells. Other types of hypersensitivity reactions of the immune system include type 2 cytotoxic antibody reactions that cause hemolytic anemia, for example, or type 3 immune complex diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, or type 4 delayed type hypersensitivity like multiple sclerosis or transplant rejection disease. I say all this to bring us to realize the complexity of the immune system and the importance and the value of modern science in advancing knowledge of what brings on human illnesses and the value of our specialists who are on the cutting edge of this field. We welcome our questions, your questions about allergy, asthma, rashes, sneezes, stuffiness, hives, coughs, bee stings, poison ivy, seasonal suffering. Your participation makes our show better. Please call in your questions or comments to 1-888-376-6225. You may also email them to questions at oncalltelevision.com. Tonight we're fortunate to have two special friends, Dr. Mark Bubak, du Bubak. Dr. Mark Bubak is certified by the American Board of Allergy and Immunology to care for adults and children with asthma and allergies. He's been active in allergy research and education with special emphasis on new allergy testing and treatment methods. A South Dakota native, his medical degree is from the University of South Dakota School of Medicine with allergy and internal medicine fellowships at the Mayo Clinic. He practices in Sioux Falls at Dakota Allergy and Asthma. Dr. Tom Luzier is also certified by the American Board of Allergy and Immunology to care for adults and children with asthma and allergies. A trained pediatrician, his medical degree is from the University of Kansas School of Medicine with residency at Fitzsimmons Army Medical Center and Allergy Immunology Fellowships at the University of Kansas School of Medicine. He practices in Aberdeen at the Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy. Welcome, gentlemen. We're tickled Thanks. to be here. So we've got an internist an allergist and a pediatrician an allergist kind of a nice little uh, balance of we think so <laughs> we do we think so so um, we're talking about allergies and I kind of did a little blurb about four types of allergies and then there's uh, hypersensitivities and then there's a fifth and there's all sorts of theory about this and the more you learn and read and uh, understand about allergic reactions, the more you realize this is indeed a complex world, but it has opened up so many 
so many different understandings of illnesses that we had no knowledge before and better treatments. Response. The uh, immune system is fabulous. Its job is to keep us well, and it's only when something goes a little amok that we actually get these diseases. And so it's amazing what all it's doing perfectly day in and day out. Uh, and then occasionally we pop up with these uh, experiments of science that really lead to our, our understanding of what's happening in our bodies. Yeah, Tom. I think it's really amazing how much we have advanced in the last five years. It, uh, we have uh, just really arrived at the ability to alter our immune system by using specific immune modifiers to uh, take care of some of these diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and ulcerative colitis and regional enteritis and even what we do in allergy and uh, immunology is we've shown that r changing your immune system is, is even cost effective. It keeps you from having to be on six, seven, eight different kinds of medicines and lowers our need for prednisone which was the only thing we could do ten years ago. It's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I have to say that when I was uh, a, a medical student working in a peripheral hospital in a small community in the state, there was an allergist who was doing some things and pretty much the other doctors in the city said, it's hocus pocus, this is not real medicine. And I, you know, it was on the verge, this gentleman uh, was on the verge of doing some good things, but some of it was kind of hocus pocus, but of course, all of medicine is not, I mean, we're none of us free of a little bit of, well, I'm not sure that this is the case, but let's try it anyway. Uh, and, but in the last five years, it has advanced greatly through the years, but in the last five years, uh, tremendously. And there's new news about the cost effectiveness of, of uh, immune therapy. Mark, what, uh, tell me a little bit more about the new data that just came out. Well, allergy shots or the other name for immuno immunotherapy. Uh, there's a great study with both adults and children followed along for a few years. And if they were having a bunch of problems, got started on allergy shots, uh, it really improved their quality of life, decreased their symptoms. But a big thing was you had close to a 40% reduction in costs. So by before the end of the first, or sorry, before the end of the second year, there was like a $4,000 difference by that point already. Uh, the, the, and savings started at three months. It was faster than we ever thought. It's the savings that would keep the kid from coming in with asthma, would decrease the visits to the emergency room, would... Decrease hospitalizations, decreased uh, ear infections, decreased sinus infections, and this did not affect, they didn't count the missed work days or anything like that. This was just medical costs. Huge. Yeah. And you, uh, you, you should have some kind of medical care for yourself. You, you sound a little sick. What's, what, what's wrong with you? Uh, you know, I got nab, nabbed by one of my little pediatric kids with a little laryngitis. <laughs> so <laughs> this, is not al this is not allergy. <laughs> and you're not on an antibiotic, are you? No. Okay, there you go. Well, Tom, what is your comment about this new research that is actually giving solid, huge support for immunotherapy? Well, again, I think it represents a, a breakthrough in that the medical community and our patients understand that this is a valuable therapy. Um, when we were talking earlier, adherence to medication is so difficult to take, uh, have your child take medicine every day, for you to take medicine every day, to take two medicines. And a lot of times with allergic disease, it's two, three, four medications that you're taking seasonally to control this, including these steroids, which have a lot of side effects. And these studies showed that you can reduce these. We used to give a shot, of big shot of steroids seasonally. Well, that's not good for you. You know, it takes out bone growth, that kind of thing. I mean, the patient felt good. You, you, you were the adequate there. The allergies kind of went down. <laughs> right, the allergies kind of went down. You were hiding them under the, by using an anti-inflammatory. And this research says that we, we really are doing immune modification and an exciting part of the study, as they've stretched it out, is that it persists past the allergy shot regimen. In other words, okay, I've finished it five years, I've, I'm, I'm not on shots anymore, what's going to happen? 
Well, what happens is, is that they continue to have a re that same reduction. Now, is it forever? No. But it certainly persists for three or four years. But I would ask, of course, I, I'm, the, uh, I'm the forever the cynic, and here's my cynicism. Who did the study? I bet it, had to, it was driven by the people who make the shots up or by the companies that sell the injectors or no. who did the study? It was the state of Florida Medicaid program. And so it was the taxpayers and their doctors and everybody, that was the data. It wasn't uh, by the companies at all. So that means it is a whale of a lot better. And you know, unfortunately, we've been riddled and driven by industry to do many things. Not to say that I'm against industry. I am very much a favor of the research driven by industry, but we have always to look skeptical at medicine that has, or science that has been driven by the person who's going to adva be advantaged by this science. We're excited because a lot of times our patients are on other medicines for other problems. And you add the burden of medication for allergy, and That's now you're wrong. taking nine medicines. You take those out, you're back down to four medicines. Well, that, that's huge. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Now, we have questions. And I have to say the first question is, is intriguing because I heard this, I think, on National Public Radio. Someone was talking about dropping the uh, pacifier and picking it up, licking it, and sucking on the pacifier and then sticking it in the mo mouth of their babe. And it was the parent's saliva given to the baby, and there was a decreased incidence of infections and allergies later on. Now, have either one of you heard that study? I've not read the study. It was on TV and the internet, I think, yesterday. Uh -huh. There's a lot of theories. It's the hygiene hypothesis. Yeah, the hygiene hypothesis. And that if you have bacteria going, it gives your immune system a certain shift in direction and keeps you out of the allergic category a right. lot better. That's why farmers are supposed to have a lot less allergy and asthma, which is what we see. Yeah, you see that. So the hygiene theory is, again, you just said it. Let's have you say it again. What is the hygiene theory? The hygiene theory is, is that your environmental exposure to certain bacteria protect you um, against infection, okay. basically. All right, so, but, but that's with kids, right? With little kids. I mean, it's better when it starts when they're very young which also makes me think, when do we start these allergy shots, these immunotherapy things that you were, you were studying in Florida, when do they get started in kids? And are we changing our opinion on when they get started? So let's do the first question. When does that hygiene have to occur? When they're very, very little? Yes, the, the pediatrician will take that one. Okay. <laughs> because oh, yeah, we'll that's you. Yeah, exactly. And, and the answer is yes. I mean, it, it is awesome. If you are born by a vaginal delivery, you have- Which is a, a much dirtier than the sterile C-section. You do much better because you, the transfer of E. coli, the mom's- um, Natural flora. Natural flora is better for your gut. So you're gonna have less gut symptoms than your counterpart that's by C-section. Based wow. on the bacteria in uh, cow manure is um, bacillus sublimus, when you inhale that, that's what they think is the thing that gives us the immune protection because it doesn't make us sick, but it does gear up our immune system. The cow, cow manure dust? Dust, right. Well, the other part would be food allergy. If you start your child younger on food, not just breast milk, say at four months of age, that is supposed to help us prevent food allergy development. Our immune system gets more tolerant to having that food around. So are you saying that kids should start eating regular food earlier than what they're, they're recommending right now? Four months of age helps keep away the peanut allergy, keep away the egg allergy. Wow. And you're, as the pediatrician, you're, you're echoing what he's saying. It, it, and and that's, that really is very controversial because you have a whole group of people that are holding on tight to um, the theory that, you know, no food until they're a year old. And some of that data shows that as soon as you stop breastfeeding, in this extent, that they are right back to, to starting with the uh, possibility of developing some allergic disease. Wow. 
Well, there you go. Lots of interesting, because pe people are very in favor of breastfeeding and extending that they, longer. They should be. They, we should do both, right? That's the idea, breastfeeding and give them Well, food. breastfeeding has a lot of immune uh, uh, mediators and characters with it that comes with the breast milk. All right. More later. Keep calling those questions in. So you are thought to have allergies, but in order to treat them effectively, we need to know just what, out of the daunting number of possibilities you are allergic to. There are tests that we can use to focus in on just what the culprit is. Allergy testing uh, that we're gonna do today is uh, prick skin tests. Uh, that's the traditional best way of doing the allergy tests. It tells us in about 15 minutes what the uh, person has allergy antibody to. And we use it for people with itchy, sneezy, runny nose, or asthma, sometimes hives. Uh, Jill will put these on. We've got a combination of some tree, grass, weed, mold, dust mite, types of things here to see how things uh, show up. A positive result looks like a mosquito bite and we have positive and negative controls and we'll read that off at 15 minutes. Uh, at times a person gets a, a little needle under the skin, it's called intradermal, and that's a, a kind of a double check, especially with weaker allergens, to, to search out uh, for allergies. A lot of congestion, mm -hmm. runny nose, coughing. I have the cough right now, so yeah. really disruptive. That's more um, in the spring. Eyes turn you? red. Yeah, always in the spring, right away when everything's blooming. Mm -hmm. I react very fast. <laughs> After this gets done, a person needs to plan out a, a special treatment program for each patient. Uh, it's what kind of things do you avoid? and we'll give you avoidance tips, uh, what kind of medications, and some of them need to be started before the season gets going. Uh, and then for quite a few folks, we end up putting them on immunotherapy or allergy shots or allergy drop type of things to make you actually less allergic over the years. 15, 25. I've um, suffered from allergies ever since I've been a child, so over the years, of course, the treatments have been different types of meds, and they've worked to some various degrees. Um, about 25, 30 years ago, I started with allergy shots, and I've um, been in various programs in the past, and the one I'm currently on is one of the better ones I have been on. So, And it's been going on for roughly about 15 years, I believe. And through that period of time, um, it's, it's been a benefit. I've noticed uh, a lot of change in my lifestyle. I mean, I've been able to enjoy life a lot more and not having that stuffed up nose or face and um, being able to go out and enjoy golfing and mowing yards and simple things like that that other people take for granted. Over all the years I've had allergy shots I've only had problems with a shot once myself and it was just a reaction and it, it was a delayed reaction It happened about two and a half hours after the shot was given which is abnormal most of the reactions if you notice the placards in the in the building there within 30 minutes of um of the injections. I could start feeling your throat get feel full and start getting hoarse and raspy and you just sort of felt funny. So it was a typical reaction that you'd expect from an allergy shot. The other treatments I've been on, they'd make you tired or, or feel sluggish or slow and you just didn't feel like yourself. And the, the thing I've realized with the allergy shots is they actually, you don't have a lot of side effects or I don't have a lot of side effects from them at all. And that's, that's made it a very good treatment for me. Along with the family, along with the girls, you know, they've um, experienced the same thing that I have with their shots. That's great. So, I mean, uh, certainly uh, immunotherapy or shots therapy like that uh, has worked for him and is worth it mm -hmm. to him. Is it indeed a little bit of that cat dander that you give? I mean, give us an example of what it is. What is the uh, the immune, immune, immune what therapy. Giving? What are we giving? What are we giving? Well, we're given the pollen is actually removed from the stamen of the plant, and somebody processes that. So they're big greenhouses full of ragweed and sagebrush. No and kidding. It, that's and then correct. They make the, the shots from the ragweed. Right, because it's got to be pretty pure. I mean, this is uh, this is not easy. And uh, the cat is uh, uh, made up of a, a basically a dander 
type thing. Uh, most of the exposure we get is from the saliva that dries on the coat and then... Uh, so you're getting cat saliva injections. Something like that. Something. Well, actually, they've gotten so sophisticated they are able to purify the protein that is needed, and that's what you get purified protein or standardized protein, okay. which is really nice. Yeah. So what's, what is it that's involved with the shots, Mark? What, tell well, the after, shots. We, after we uh, find out what a person's truly allergic to and correlate the history and the tests, then we make up the uh, serum or the medicine that's actually going to be given. Uh, to the patient, and we start at a teeny dose and work its way up to a target. Right. And there are standard amounts that are needed or else you're not going to get better. Uh, and gradually as time goes along our immune system becomes adapted so that we're less allergic to that, those substances. Right. And, and so, but is the shot a painful experience? Not, not really. A person gets the shot, it gets drawn up uh, into the little vial in your needle and it's given in the back of the arm. It needs to be given at a medical facility to be done safely, so there'd be a doc or a PA or a nurse practitioner. These are not given at home. That's not been standard of care for at least 15 years. Well, because you can have a... Have a, a, a an anaphylactic severe, reaction. Yeah. And we, I think that our patients deserve good care. Uh, and the person gets it, they're observed for 30 minutes. Uh, they can do their homework. That's why allergic kids are so much smarter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I always tease them about they that. Get, they get that homework done. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's really a nice system to gradually become less allergic. You're not tired. You're not really getting medicines. You're just getting the natural uh, protein that they'd be uh, getting normally. So kids shouldn't be scared of this. It's, you know, it, all treatments are scary. Uh, I was reminded of that today, you know, having sick is bad, getting something uh, as a treatment can be scary, but knowing that you're going to be better, and truthfully shots are probably better when the kids are closer to seven or so, maybe eight, and they're not afraid of the needles. And the other thing is, is that you'd like to have an age group where they can tell you if they're having an issue with the shot, in other right. words, they can communicate with you. So that's that's kind of the bottom line for us. We, we sometimes have a, a six-year-old that that seems uh, able to communicate with us. And because for me as a pediatrician, I know that if I can desensitize the patient, I, in adolescence, they're not gonna have as much asthma playing basketball and running track and that kind of thing, because that's been shown very clearly to prevent asthma in adolescence. Right. If you do that, that's a very good thing. So, and, and the real question is, how young? Six to seven. I, you don't start there. And, and then how old? How, how old you, can you go? There's no limit. You, you have to be healthy and not have certain, you know, like a bad ticker, something like right. that. And there's some medications that you might require for cardiovascular yeah. disease that are not very good and compatible with the some, allergy some, shot. You know, people can get allergies at any age. And so if you start becoming allergic to the cat and the ragweed and you're 60, these shots are as likely to work as if you got that when you're 15. All right. So the the issue is is it mostly cat allergies, mostly ragweed, mostly asthma? I mean, what's the most common allergy situation? Number one allergen in the United States is grass pollen. So grass pollen, and that's going to be so. But we hew, we hit the trees first, then the grass, then the then the. Uh, right. The, We're about a week away from. I mean, we've had a slow season because you need to have soil temperature up. You need to right. kind of watch the wheat. And remember, we have grass that we grow so that we have some abnormal seasons. And corn is a grass, but it's so big that it tends to drop. But if you're a grass pollen allergic person watching, walking through a tasseling cornfield, you're going to be in trouble. So, so the, okay, so grass is the most common, not, yep. not ragweed. That nope. surprised me. Okay, so first is the trees, though. Tree, tree allergy is going to hit in a week? It's here. It's so April it's April and May. April and May. It's full steam. Right. It doesn't care about soil temperature. So tree allergies go on full speed. If you're really stuffy right now, this may be it. You sure you don't have tree allergy? <laughs> you don't get this. <laughs> okay. And then, so we're about a week away to the grass allergies. Correct. So, so they little bit, they, a little bit of overlap. Remember that people think that the cotton coming off a cottonwood tree is from tree sensi uh, sensitivity, it's from grass sensitivity. Why is that? Because when the seeds are formed for cottonwood, we're still having grass pollen season. Oh, so it's really, it isn't the cottonwood. It is the, the, tree, the grass that's happening. That's it has exactly nothing to do with the cottonwood. Right. So, and then the season for the ragweed and that 
First starts. of August, basically in Aberdeen. First, of, you can almost set your watch. By. So let's say I'm not on shots, but I know full well that I'm going to get sick in pff, August. Let's say, okay, it's a ragweed season. I should start my steroid nasal spray when? About a week or two beforehand. So Easily. a week or two. Easily a week. Uh, okay. Probably two weeks. Two probably weeks is the best. We've got questions. We do Perfect. want your questions and comments about tonight's co t topic. Call in 1-888-376-6225, not too late, or email at questions at oncalltelevision.com. Uh, we have a call from Rapid City. How does a person know whether symptoms are from a cold or an allergy? How do you know? Well, if you have allergies, you itch. You have itchy eyes, you have itchy nose. That's the big differentiator. And colds last a week to 10 days. Most allergy seasons go on quite, you know, it's like a, a month or two. Uh, the classic cold is a, a sore throat and a fever for one or two days. You lose your voice about day three. Bingo. This is a, this is a good Perfect cold. example this of a cold. cold. It's a virus. He's not, not sneezing. Not on an antibiotic. And then last, the cough can last up to two weeks. But the, when you start having a fever day five, six, then you're in trouble. You might have pneumonia. Now, allergic people, it's a little tricky. If you have big allergy and you get an upper respiratory infection, there's a crowd of cells in there. So your, your um, upper respiratory infections are a little more violent and a little more intense than the person who oh. does not have this. Wow. And we expect that people with allergies are going to catch two extra colds a year. Very good. They and just do. With the, the immunology of the immune reaction from the allergies sets up the receptors for the cold viruses to attach easier. They need, allergics need a lower dose to get infected. Wow. We have a, a regular uh, person who called from Sioux Falls, was allergy testing years ago and was negative to shrimp, now develops hives with shrimp. What happened? It sounds like he's allergic to shrimp. Yeah, and, and but and because it does, before. because the point is, is just what, what Mark said. You can develop an allergy anywhere in your lifetime. And you can have a negative test and then have a challenge like this to shrimp and develop um, hives. The interesting thing is, is that to de develop just hives with ingestion of shrimp is a little unusual because you usually get a whole lot of other symptoms with it. So, so when the person comes into me and says, I think I'm allergic to shrimp and I get hives, and they don't have anything in their mouth and they don't have, when they eat the shrimp, then I'm thinking, oh, what, what, is there something else going here? Histidine, Correct. the fish, the, the shrimp breaks down the protein, there's some stuff that can make you itchy. If there's a histamine releasing Bad. substance in it, and if it's a shrimp that's um, taken a certain part of the year when they're uh, during their sexual cycle, it has more of this histidine in it. You know, I had a patient who had a tremendous allergy to shrimp because he worked at a, at a restaurant and was preparing the shrimp and his hands would just break out whenever, he, I mean, he knew it was the shrimp. So, became a, an accountant, got a different job, couldn't, work, couldn't do the shrimp. Washington Springs, discuss coughing asthma. Does it ever turn into serious wheezing asthma? Coughing asthma versus wheezing asthma. I think that typically it sticks more with the cough, but it sure can turn into more wheezing. Absolutely. Yeah. We, you know, that, that, that we call it cough variant asthma. We actually have a name for it. And it's a cough that is associated with airway reactivity. And remember, we've talked about this before. That is some low-grade inflammation in the airway, which causes that airway reactivity. Yeah. And definitely that can increase. And a lot of times I see that cough variant asthma worsen with specific upper respiratory and lower respiratory infections. Yeah, my, my take home today is to say to those people who are using a lot of Alupent, which is a beta, uh, a beta, uh, yeah, albuterol. albuterol. I don't think I'm much way, yeah. Alupent, yeah. baiting um, yourself. That, I'm sorry, <laughs> that means I that don't remember Alupent. You're, you, these people can yes. get into trouble. I mean, they can die from too much albuterol. And, the, uh, and they have a long acting albuterol now. That can be troublesome too. But we know full well that if you get the steroid on that long acting, then people will actually take it because the steroid is the treatment and the albuterol, long acting albuterol, is the trick to actually take the darn steroid. Exactly. And the albuterol uh, should only be a rescue. It's, it's a rescue drug, not a regular treatment. Any unless, unless you're doing it before exercise. All right, that's understandable. Here's from Belfouche. 
Can mild or spotty nosebleeds be tied to allergies? Well, he's in Belfouche, and it's pretty dry in Belfouche. So the answer is yes, it can be, because you have this chronic runny nose, and, and you have this you have wet to, to dry, and, and you're and picking, and, and that's right, exactly. Wiping and blowing and picking and soreness. Crusting and all And then low-grade infections that are there. But what do you treat that with, this person who has an irrit irritated inner nose? Well, again, I, I, I have to see, because rhinitis itself has a lot of differential associated with it, but I tend to use, if it's the inflammatory part, cut the inflammation down. That's the topical steroid that we use. I frequently use an ointment in the nose if it's just a person who needs moisture in what their nose. What kind of ointment? I usually use mercurisin is, is what I use, which is a, it has a little antibiotic and it takes care of some of that anterior infections, kind of what we use in nurses sometimes with, MR, with MRSA. MRSA, MRSA yeah, yeah. Yeah. In your comment? I think it, you, th those are hard because there's so many things it could be that, the that could be the problem. And, and having a good exam, typically by an ENT doc, to make sure there's not some structural thing. Yeah. Or a tumor or some, you know. But I'm going to use this as a springboard mm -hmm. to state that, you know, if you're not getting the shots and you're not taking oral steroids, uh, and you've got nose allergy kind of symptoms, uh, even if you don't have nose, uh, one of the best treatments we have is, to, uh, tell me I'm wrong, you guys told me this, both of you, uh, that it's a steroid nasal spray, like a uh, fluticasone nasal spray or this QVAR nasal. Uh, 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 some dry ones like that. Yeah. Some yeah. dry ones like that. And, and they actually work like 60% of the time, whereas the claritins are like 20%, 30% effective. And you're talking percent reduction in symptoms in right. a moderately bad hay fever right. patient. Agree. Right. Oh yeah, that, the, the whole point is is that uh, topical steroid takes care of the inflammation, the other one's taking care of the itching and sneezing. So we have two different symptom complexes. Very, very important. Allergies can be life altering. Uh, a sufferer and their friends and family have to be on constant vigil for potential exposures to allergens. And in some cases, the reaction can be so severe that the need for an EpiPen is warranted. We visited with a mother of a child who is extremely sensitive. He has periodic anaphylactic reactions. So he's had it really since he was born. Um, we found out when he was, we diagnosed what he had when he was about 14 months old. Um, so it does cause anaphylaxis quite a bit. So EpiPens are a daily part of our lives. Everything basically uh, causes an allergic reaction. Um, he's able to have a total of seven foods right now. We started using the EpiPen when he was about 14 months old. Right now, we're using them less and less because we're, we're better trained at what to watch for. But I would say at least once every three months we're using it. And sometimes we might use it three times in one month. He knows how to EpiPen himself. He hasn't done it himself, but um, we all of my, I have a seven-year-old, a six-year-old, a three-year-old, and a two-year-old. And they all have practiced using the EpiPen and know how to use an EpiPen and understand what an EpiPen's for. It's kind of more probably the traumatic way that it happens versus even just the, the shot. Because you have to do it pretty forcefully. Like you have to really, you have to stab really hard. If you just stab lightly, the, it doesn't go in. So you really have to like kind of violently stab really hard. So just the action of somebody doing that really quickly and stabbing you in the leg with it. Um, I think the suddenness of it is painful for a couple seconds. Within the first couple minutes, you already start to see like a breathing ease. Um, sometimes we've had a situation where we've had to do it twice or we've gotten to the, we go to the emergency room often after we use it. For example, we have the lifestyle or his type of disease that we have like six of them because we have one in the car, one at daycare, one in my purse, one on him all the time. So, um, but it's covered by insurance. We did have an anaphylax once when I didn't have an EpiPen on me, um, and that was probably, it was very scary. So in some ways an EpiPen I think is a miracle because um, I don't think Gideon would be able to survive or live 100 years ago or 50 years ago. The EpiPen gives him the freedom to have a normal childhood and gives us the comfort of knowing that we can um, help him if he needed it. They do expire. 
Um, and so when you get an EpiPen, make sure you ask for like, I've gotten EpiPens where they'll expire in 30 days. Mm -hmm. And so I, now I know to ask for the EpiPen that's not on the front of the shelf, but on the back of the shelf that has a 12 month span in it. So you do have to renew your EpiPens and look at the expiration date on them. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, we, we, we do appreciate your calls. Call one 888 376-6225 or on calltelevision.com for tonight's uh, or questions at oncalltelevision.com. Please give us your calls. Well, we have a, 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 a caller from Sioux Falls. Is it true that all disease is a failure of the immune system? Tom. Well, that's actually a great question. It is. It's, it's a fabulous it's a question. It's a great question. One could argue, oh, well, that the infection is because the immune system didn't fight it off. Mm -hmm. or the aging process, vascular disease. You know, one could argue there's, there's an immune system problem going on. And then you could say that all disease is genetic, what? that you're pre-programmed for what diseases you have. So that's, you know, the all is not a very no. good way to look at it. Uh, there's such a neat interplay between uh, like the microbes in our environment and how our particular <laughs> Uh, immune system deals with that and it'll help guide us one pathway or other. You know, you think of ulcers. We always never realized that was an infectious disease. Uh, and so injuries obviously aren't a failure, you know, if you get in a car wreck. Yeah, but a lot mean. of things really do. Unless play you were off reaching or, for a tissue paper with that's a sneeze right. and that's then yeah. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but not everything. Yeah. But it's but a lot. But a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot. Certainly, uh, some people say that the inflammatory reaction surrounding a tumor with an immune, special immune ability of that tumor uh, allows the tumor to grow, encourages it to grow. It's well, an actually, it, it, it puts off something that blocks your immune system, and so you, you don't recognize it. Yeah. So it has a, a non-recognition, and so a lot of the research they're doing is to uh, allow the body to recognize its own tumor. issue, its own tumor. Uh, for a long time, they just ground up melanoma cells and injected them um, and had some success in, the, in that very devastating disease. Oh, yeah. I remember when that first article came out and then all of the, 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 the debate and the discussion and the controversy that followed that what, 20 years ago. Yes. And right. now they're doing things with tissue necrosis factor and so on with, uh, with cancers. We have a call from Brookings, six month old infant has eczema, has bright red patches on the face, has oozing bleeding on the face only. Current treatment, what laundry soap, does sunshine help? These are, this is a good question now. What is eczema? What is atopic uh, well, this, dermatitis? Well, this little one, again, you have to have a great relationship with your doc because this is a control factor and you need to be working with your doc. But it's obvious that um, there's not enough emollient and not a greasing up enough to allow the skin to be protective. So now it's just hang, because you're missing a protein, filigran. And filigran. so filigran. A protein that, on the skin. Protein that yeah. keeps it hydrated. So now once it breaks out like this, now that's open like a burn. And so you have to, you have to work with it a little more. You got to make sure it doesn't get infected. Um, you know, these kids at six months are drooling when they're laying in bed and breaking the skin down on their cheeks, which is another challenge. So you really have to get a thick, like, ointment on the skin in order for it to, to protect that skin and keep it hydrated. A zinc oxide ointment right after uh, is one way, but those are these white, thick, greasy things. The ceramide is a new barrier that has been, that the dermatologist who was on my show a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, just, CeraVe. CeraVe right. is one version, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, these kinds of wonderful barriers and, against and moisture. And not having a lot of side effect, because in the old days they used a lot of steroid. Again, it does work, and, and I use it a lot, but I want you to first think about hydration of the skin by putting these emollients on. Right. So, any, you're and laundry soap, I, and in regards to that, um, you know, I just tell people to double rinse and, their, um, and not use any bounce or any kind of additives in their 
uh, preparation of the sheets and that kind of thing for their babies. Because uh, how much bounce allergies do we have? Is that a well, it's pretty irritating. I yeah. mean, they, it puts something in your skin to make you, I mean, your skin. <laughs> it puts something in your shirt to make it soft. Yeah. Kind of. The other thing would be, uh, you know, a third of the kids have like egg that they're eating that might be a co-trigger, but that's not everybody. That's just a part of it. Once the, uh, the other thing would be super antigen. Once the barrier is broken down, you got raw skin. Just the bacteria colonizing our skin stimulates the eczema to be worse. So, getting control of that uh, sometimes is really is needed. can often be helpful. And there is evidence that you know the light waves do help calm down the immune reaction. So the that sun, skin. sun, the sun. But so you got to be careful. All in, six all in moderation yeah. with yeah, that sun type done. of stuff. Uh, you know, if you look at half the, half the people that are watching have dry skin. I mean, these Scandinavian, German, light skin, blonde, blue eyed people, kind of like you. you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, or Scotch Irish. Mm -hmm. These people don't seem to have the barrier protectors that they have and of course if you take hot hot showers which you do in South Dakota because you've been cold in the winter this long winter and then you scrub hard and uh, you dry out uh, then you've got dry skin patches of dry skin you scratch it it gets worse the scratch gets it infected absolutely it itches more because there's inflammation and then you've got that vicious whole cycle. cycle that's right and so the hot shower is not a great idea over a long period of time. I, I have teenagers come in sometimes and I'll look at their skin and I'll go, how long do you take a shower? Oh, for an hour. I said, well, that's not yeah. too good. <laughs> you get your moisturizer on right afterwards though. Jump, yes. jump right on to Sarah V. Three, three minute time. Within three minutes, is yeah. that what you just said? Yes, that's what, because it, it traps the moisture on Dry your skin. Dry off before your moisture loses it. Yep. Pat Trap off. it. Pat off. Pat off. Sarah moisture. V. Yep. There you go. So that was enough on eczema, which is a broader term than atopic dermatitis, but atopic dermatitis, which yeah, they're pretty much the pretty much close to the same thing. Vermilion, he witnesses people who have cats in their homes, not clean, urine on the floor, furniture. Can people get feline leukemia? Could you comment on people in homes that don't keep their house clean of urine? Urine exposure, particularly cat urine exposure. Time. Well, I, again, the cat urine exposure is going to bother you if you're an allergic person because it has feldy one in it. That's the active protein in cats. Um, and I'm not aware that you could get feline leukemia. It wouldn't make any sense because uh, urine is an ultrafiltrate and probably doesn't carry anything. No. Th there are some viruses that can, you know, be transmitted in urine, but I, I, I don't, that, it, the whole habit of not keeping your house clean uh, speaks of something different than just the, right. the cat related. And certainly pregnant women in particular are at risk for cat exposure like that. So you, it, we, we want to have, if you're pregnant, you want to be in a very clean environment. You, any comment about the, no comment. All right. So I would certainly no feline leukemia is spread by urine. Uh, Rapid City visited Alabama and had allergies. Should she expect those allergies to go away now that she's back in Rapid City? How long until the symptoms go away? And what was she allergic to in Alabama? You know, the hard part's going to be what time of year you went to Alabama, uh, what was pollinating, or did you have a lot more dust mite? Uh, it's a lot drier out in Rapid, so you wouldn't have as much dust mites. And so it would be what season it was, and is it going to be kitten here? You know, a lot of people will hit a tree or a grass season early down south and they'll just come back and they'll go right into the start of ours. And that's the beauty of getting the testing done. You find out. You find out what's going on. So that's and, it's, and skin testing is a much more accurate assessment of your immune system than the blood test. And we use the blood test, but it's much more accurate. So it's a much more accurate test. It's a little bit more expensive, and then they stick the, these. Not no, less expensive. It's, it's about That's a half to a third the cost of the blood. So it, skin testing is better, and it's way cheaper. cheaper. So and there's these other things. There are places where you can go to get drops in the mouth or sublingual treatment instead of the shots. I mean, you know, and I'm you know I'm not really happy about getting shots. And so, what about those uh, those kind of sublingual treatments? Well, sublingual treatment has treatment. treatment. That's right. <laughs> They're very. That's very special. Um, yes. <laughs> sublingual therapy has has 
never been standardized. So there was a lot being done at different levels. And for grass and ragweed and dust mite, there's been enough studies to show that sublingual therapy can be successful in about 30 to 40 percent of the people doing it. You have to be very compliant, so adherent to this. You have to do it just right because you've got to hold this in your mouth for two minutes. But it is effective and Mark and I have been struggling with should we introduce that to our patients since 2006. We've waited this long. The data has now supported that there's evidence that supports doing this in sp for specific antigens and so we've embarked on doing it in a very limited amount. And I would say that the data here in the states is, is good for ragweed and grass and the dose that's required it's just been the last few months that we know and it takes 20 to 50 times the dose that we've given shots you have to do it every day consistently for quite some time and it'll help you uh, it's not as effective as the shots but if you got somebody that absolutely won't take shots they hate nose sprays this is a great little new addition to our, our uh, treatment yeah what is the cost of shots and what is the cost of the oral treatments that you're talking about and they don't have to be at the office to get no, the oral treatment the, you know the the allergy shots have been out for 101 years since they were reported as effective and so your insurance company helps you with the costs of that whereas drops are non-standard they're not FDA approved they're a use of a medicine that's in a different way and so that's all out of pocket and it's the cost varies a lot well and we don't have the data that we have on immunotherapy showing that it decreases cost. We know it decreases symptoms, we know it decreases medication use when you're on the shots, but we don't have evidence that it actually decreases costs at this particular time. Um, so it's not just what Mark was saying, it's not quite as effective, um, but it's an, it's an alternative because you can do it at home and uh, it has less um, less uh, potential for anaphylaxis, which the uh, shots do. But not so, zero. But, but not, not zero. zero. Yeah. So uh, my, my sense is then that, that the shots are the better option and skin testing are the better option. The only, and I've thought this a long time, but I've been, I've been taught by you guys. I mean, you know. So, but my, my, my take home on that is that they're still expensive, but you can prove that they're less expensive than not having them if you truly have an allergy. How severe is the allergy before you really start the shots? That's the, the final bottom line question. People who have bad hay fever that's not controlled by meds would be one group. If you have four months or more of a year that you have symptoms, they're very helpful. You know, if you have both hay fever and asthma, you're treating two different diseases. You may want to jump in a lot sooner. Okay. I've, uh, these are quick, quick questions. Uh, what can be done for exercise-related asthma? Uh, Pre-exercise albuterol is a good alternative, and if that doesn't control it, then oral singular combined with pre-exercise. Um, and if I'm going to the albuterol. Olympics, will they let me use uh, pre-exercise albuterol? They've yes. changed their ruling on that one. Uh, here's from Jefferson a regular person calling. For years, she goes in cough that started with sinus problems. Docs say it was asthma and gave spray, but didn't work. What can be done? She uses cough syrup and she has glaucoma. I think you have to figure out, is it really asthma or is it post-nasal drainage? Reflux. The, re, yeah, the reflux could do it. She could have some other things in the back of the throat giving a problem. Okay, could you guys quickly in less than a minute say anything about gluten, gluten intolerance? Is that in your field, your bailiwick, Tom? Well, gluten intolerance is uh, a term that really has no bearing. We have celiac disease, which has, is a specific immune disease of the GI tract causing the inability to appropriately digest gluten and then develops an inflammatory response to that uh, protein. And that's a specific group. Now of interest, people of Irish descent have a much higher incidence of those. People of Finnish descent have that. All right. Well, we'll talk more about that after this. 
is nothing more precious than your baby. Nothing more important than keeping him safe. As he grows and changes, so do you. We learn new things together every day. The new Safe Sleep Guidelines can help give your baby the best possible start to a healthy life. Keep your baby safe. Learn more about safe sleep practices for baby's sake. It was a hot summer many years ago and the red-faced toddler was screaming bloody murder. She was in to see the pediatrician I was following because of an intense rash occurring on her forearms, neck, and around her eyes. It was making the child miserable and appeared to be only worsened by her incessant scratching. I remember my teacher saying the words eczema and atopic dermatitis as I looked on with, at that uncomfortable child and sympathetically suffering mother. The term eczema is from the Greek to boil over and generally is a broad term to describe a dry, scaly, itchy, and red skin inflammation or dermatitis, the cause of which is often undefined. Or there is an eczema more specifically called atopic dermatitis that usually starts in children under five and is something with which they will suffer all their lives. It is an allergy driven type of condition which runs in families, often affects those troubled with asthma or hay fever, and can break out over the wrists, in front of the elbows, around the eyes, on the neck, behind the knees, and on the ankles. Whether or not an allergy is identified and is a part of this, the primary cause of atopic dermatitis is the rash causing scratching, which is causing an inflammatory cascade cracks in the skin, invasion of bacteria or fungal infection, more inflammation, which in turn worsens the itching, causes more scratching, and thus a vicious cycle. Too often people worsen the inflammation with excessive scrubbing and cleansing, too hot water, harsh soaps and rubbing alcohol, or with creams and salves saturated with an allergy triggering perfume or antibiotics. The treatment starts with cutting fingernails and providing something to control the itch, avoiding any trauma, perfumes, or toxins, gently cleansing without soap or body wash, turning off the inflammatory cycle with topical steroid creams or ointments and or oral steroids, and by protecting the skin with a barrier such as a dressing or a ceramide cream. Once the rash is controlled, allergy testing might be considered. Those years ago, that red-faced toddler with atopic dermatitis was provided a similar treatment that proved very helpful. I remember when we saw the child back a few days later, how the rash was almost gone and how the child and the mother were so relieved. Atopic dermatitis, an allergic thing. I remember looking at that child and saying, what can you do, Dr. Heinrichs? What can you do to help this poor baby? And he did it, uh, and it was amazing. A Watertown uh, pediatrician. And we had, and we've done lots of different therapies with severe atopic dermatitis. When I was in Denver at National Jewish, we had the worst of the worst, and we would really, literally, wrap these people in um, gauze and wet that gauze down or have the children in pajamas that were already wetted down Ooh. in order to maintain that hydration because we, we didn't know quite how to do it and we didn't have these great emollients that literally replace what, the, what is missing in the skin. Well, we've used to be using Vaseline and really thick stuff, but that's kind of hard to tolerate. Uh, Mark, any, any other comments? We've got like 30 seconds. The atopic dermatitis kids are just a challenge because they drool, they still want to be kids, they're scratching, it's so irritating and intrusive on their lives and the parents. So you guys have the right treatments down. There's nothing I can There's add. Nothing to add. So take home yeah. message for uh, you guys, uh, 20 seconds. Allergy show, comments? Well, I think the thing that we really wanted to come with was that what we do for therapy really does help in, the, in this atmosphere of cost effectiveness. So it, it truly is a breakthrough um, in the last two years. Great. 
Well, this brings us to the end of our show this evening. I sincerely thank our studio guests, allergy and asthma specialists, Dr. Mark Bubach and Dr. Tom Luzier for helping to answer all the insightful questions from our audience. Comedian and composer Steve Allen had this to say about his allergies. Asthma doesn't seem to bother me anymore unless I'm around cigars or dogs. The thing that would bother me most would be a dog smoking a cigar. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Funding for On Call is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call, starting its 11th year of opening doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.